Do you ever notice when discussing object-oriented versus functional uh, programming that it's almost never about the core concepts of objects and functions? Uh, usually it just goes into conversations about you know referential transparency, encapsulation, polymorphism, and, and uh, uh, etc. And uh, I, I find all those very interesting, very powerful tools, but fundamentally uh, it's not really what I'm interested in when I'm thinking about the actual con concepts of objects and functions. Because realistically, you can achieve a high level of all of those concepts in either paradigm. And a lot of the issues that you find in object-oriented code, you can find in some functional code and just different, uh, with different patterns and stuff like that. And so today I wanted to discuss uh, objects and functions. Um, and kind of show how they're really not that conceptually different. As a matter of fact, I would argue that one may be a more fundamental version of the other, uh, whatever that means. But I, uh, one of my favorite, two of my favorite books have really given me a lot more clarity in the concepts of objects and functions. And I think they're um, very interesting reads. And uh, Structures and Interpretation of Computer Programs, which is the first book I'll show, um, I actually demonstrated what I'm going to demonstrate in this video first. And it's one of those things that if you don't think about it, uh, it, it at first it doesn't really you know, sound right. Objects and functions, they seem totally different. But when you actually dig into it and think about it a little bit more, it almost become, it becomes pretty obvious, the, the similarities. And that's one thing I really found profound about, uh, about this book, um, one, one, one of many different things that I, I found pretty profound. So uh, first off, this is uh, Structures and Interpretations of Computer Programs, One, uh, just a really great book. I really recommend that you pick it up if you're interested in computer science. Now you can also get, uh, th this one is the Scheme edition, but you can get it in several other languages. Um, I, I am of the opinion that the Scheme one has the deepest, most like, it, it, it goes a lot deeper and I think it's a lot more interesting personally, but it can be a little bit more unapproachable if you're not familiar with the Scheme language. Another book I recommend is Small Talks, Small Talk Object and Design. Um, this is really interesting. This is a really interesting book and it has really given me a lot of thoughts about object-oriented programming that I, I really haven't uh, engaged with. And so uh, today, let me demonstrate how objects and functions aren't so different. And to do that, I'm going to be using one of my favorite programming languages called Racket. Now, if you're not familiar with Racket, it is a scheme Lisp-like language, or it's a scheme implementation, which is like a Lisp-like language. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, you can think of it as a family of languages that use a very consistent syntax, where the syntax actually represents the da underlying data type. So if you're writing uh, Python, you can think of, instead of writing the Python syntax, you'd be writing dictionaries and lists and value and numbers and stuff like that as the actual source code. And then you can enable and disable uh, evaluation of different pieces of that, uh, of that data. And so it allows you to implement some really powerful um, features and stuff. The object system that I'll be developing using just functions, uh, this will apply to basically any language. You can do this in almost any language that has uh, the notion of a closure basically a function that you can pass around that contains a, a you know an environment that uh, captures the outer environment. Now um, let, let's actually talk about what a function and what an object is. So uh, let me define what a function is. I, I would say it is, you can think of it you know in a mathematical sense, uh, you giving given a value, it will return a different value. And uh, for it to be referentially transparent, it means that for every x that you pass it, you'll always get the same y. And this is a really powerful concept in functional programming because it means that your functions are always predictable, right? They'll always give you exactly what you, uh, what you expect. Um, now when it comes to objects, what an, what an object is, is it is this basically a small little application that you have within your own pr uh, program that you can pass around throughout your program. And it's a thing that you uh, can communicate with and change via passing something called messages. Uh, so what I'm describing is called a message passing object oriented system. But conceptually, it's really no different than uh, an object system that uses methods with dynamic dispatch and all that. Um, so an object, you, you, you can't see any of its internal state. 
it's encapsulated, right? Yeah. So like all of the variables and all the features that make, let's say you have an object that it represents a person, the name, the age, maybe its strength, um, any attribute that you can attribute to a person will be contained within that object. And if you want to know anything about that internal state, you have to communicate with that object. So you have to ask it, what is your name? What is your age? Uh, move to this location, you know? And then you would also give it, uh, you know, the different parts of your application that it needs to have access to. And so everything is bundled up into this little application that you can pass around throughout your program. Um, and you can have many, everything can be this, uh, these little modules that you can pass around. Now, that sounds a lot different than a function, but let, let, let's, let's run down some of the similarities. All right, so functions can, uh, and specifically I'm referring to functions that are closures. Functions that are closures, they have an environment. This is a dictionary, um, kind of like a dictionary stack that you can store variables within, right? And you can give it uh, values, you can pass it values, and it will return you values, right? Uh, now let's talk about objects. An object has an internal, uh, internal state, so we'll just call that an environment. And you can give it state, and you can pass it messages. And then you can get back state and messages, usually in the form of an object. So conceptually, they're really not so different, are they? And uh, you can actually form an object system using just functions. Now, a little caveat there, just functions, but I will be using um, some pattern matching uh, because pattern matching makes this a lot easier. Under the hood, even the pattern matching is still a function, but uh, it has a different syntax because of, of Lisp and end scheme. Okay, so I'm going to give you a basic rundown of the syntax of Racket, just because it is a little bit different if you're not familiar with it, um, but hopefully uh, it'll become a little bit more intuitive as, uh, as we go along. So first things first, uh, everything in Racket is enclosed in parentheses. So I'm going to be using Python as an example because I believe a lot of people probably can read the Python syntax. Um, and so I'll, I'll try to map between the two so that we can see how Racket differs. So if I wanted to define a variable in Racket, I would say define my var and let's make it 42. And now we have a variable, Whoop, we have a variable uh, that's 42 and I can evaluate it and then see its value over on the right hand side there in the redevelop print loop. Now in Racket or in uh, Python, this would look something like this. My var is equal to 42. So what we have here is we have this uniform syntax where this is basically, you can think of it as a function call, right? So if I want to print something in Python, I'll do hello world. If I want to print something in Racket, basically you just take the statement and you shift the parentheses. You move it here. And now it will work the same. So if I do this, uh, and let me get rid of this, you can see it prints hello world. And this applies to everything, right? So if we have one plus two plus three, this will get translated to plus one, two, three, like so, um, which you can immediately see is actually kind of uh, a benefit of the syntax because we don't have to specify, you know, one more operator. We can just specify it once, and then everything after it is just a list of arguments that you pass to the function. Um, you know, things can get a little more complicated if we do one times two over three. That would translate over to times one divided by uh, two divided by three. So, you know, math is a little bit clunky, I would argue. Um, it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around. But everything else in the language, uh, it's very uniform, very slick. And if you get used to the editor uh, that you're working with, something like Emacs, or in this case, it's Dr. Racket with the Emacs key bindings built in, it can be a very pleasant language to edit and work with. Um, and it has become one of my favorite languages uh, to do stuff with. So anyway, um, I'll continue demonstrating uh, how it's similar to Python um, as I'm going. But first, let's start defining an object. So I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to define an animal, right? Because I think this is a pretty standard way of uh, defining an object. And I'm going to define it in terms of a function. So real quick, let, let me describe what a function, how to define functions. So in Python, it'd be def factorial n 
and then over here you'd have the the body of the function. All right, so let's do this in Racket. We can do define factorial n, and then the body of the function. So as you can see here, uh, it's very uniform, right? When we're saying define x as y, uh, and then we say define x as y, um, it's pretty much the same thing. What we're saying is define a func uh, variable named x that has a uh, something called a lambda, which you can think of it as a, well, it, it's a lambda, as, uh, if you're familiar with other languages, um, that yields a y, right? So these two are conceptually the same, um, at least under the hood. So what we have here is a function definition. So we're going to define an animal as just a function. And before we do anything, I'm going to just leave it here. And uh, actually, OK, so an animal probably should have some properties. So let's define a few properties. Let's do a name, all right? So an animal's name, let's just say its default name is just animal. And then maybe we have a an age, because animals have ages. And we'll probably default that to probably 0. All right, so we have a function that defines a few variables. Now, how do we have access to those variables? Let's say we want to let's say we want to create some methods to update the age, update the name, etc. So we can do or, or to get the name and get the the function or the value of the of the age. So we can do define name, and traditionally uh, to set a value to make a setter, you would use this exclamation mark. Um, but for the sake of this, just so that the syntax is a little less weird. Uh, I'm going to just name it name set, or maybe even better would be set name. And then what we can do is we can have a new name up here as an argument, and we can just set the value of name to new name. Now this is equivalent to saying new name is equal to name in Python. All right, so we can do that with the age as well. Set age, new age, set age to new age, and then we can get create some getters for these. So we can say get name, and we'll just yield a name, and then we can get age, and we'll return the age. OK, so we have a little bit of a problem, though, right? So uh, I'm just going to return false from this um, value right here. And uh, let's construct an animal. So we can just call the animal function, and we get back false. Now, this is really not useful, because all the state is encapsulated within the environment of you know, the animal function. So let's let's do something. What if we return a function, right? We return a lambda, and the first argument can be the name of the method that we want to uh, that we want to call, and then this the rest of the arguments can be uh, the, argu the the arguments passed to that method, right? So let's do that. We'll do lambda, and then we'll say message msg, and then we'll do args like this. Um, this syntax is just the, you can think of them as uh, the var args in Python. Um, so if you do like a dot right here, everything after it will be the just a list of arguments that we can pass. Um, and then what we can do here is we can use match, which is pattern matching, which is also in Python nowadays. And we can match on, let's say, set name. And when we get the message set name, we'll call set name. And we'll just pass it the first value of args. Um, let me do first, like so. And uh, if we get a message that we don't understand, we'll just yield an error. We'll say, hey, um, unexpected message, blah, whatever it is. So if we evaluate this, let's create a variable to store an animal. And we'll do that. And now if we call a, um, it's going to complain that we haven't given it uh, as enough arguments, we have to actually give it the method that we want to call. So we'll say set name and then test. And uh, ignore the result, but as you can see, we didn't get an error, which means it actually did update the inner internal state of A, the internal name. All right, so that's not very useful if we can't have access to the name. So let's make get name and we'll just return, or actually we'll just call get name. Now, if you wanted to make this a little simpler, you could just say, return name, you know, but whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll make it a, actually call a function. And then if we define a new animal, we set its name, and then we can do a get name. And, oop. Ah, okay, I found the error. 
we need to surround these in parentheses. That is my bad. And one more thing right there. Let's remove that. All right, let's define an animal. Let's set the name, and then we'll get the name. And you can see that we have successfully updated the internal state of our object here. Okay, cool. So we have an object, it has some methods, and that's awesome. So we have a base animal, but what if we want to make some more specific uh, animals, for instance, like a lion. So what we can do is we can define a new function, call it a lion, and maybe a lion takes in, let's say you can give it a variable called is king, all right, and then we can define is king, and then that'll just be is king. Actually, even better yet, we don't even need to define local state like that. So what we can do up here, uh, we can move the name and the age up here, and uh, whoop, get rid of these. All right, so now uh, the variable is actually stored within the arguments here, and I can test that that works just by going up here. Let's create our little test case. Um, now we have to pass it the name, test, 42, 32, sure. And then if we get name, we can see it's test. All right, now let's create the, uh, let's, let's make it so that we can dispatch on a new set of messages. So we'll do lambda message args. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is make it so you can say match on the message is king. I'm going to give it a question mark just to make it a little bit different than the variable name. And we'll just return is king. And now what we can do is if we don't match on any of the uh, any of these messages, uh, let's create a base. And it's going to be an animal. Lion. And let's just give it the basic age of 24, sure. Uh, what we can do is we can say, if we don't understand the message, then we'll just forward that to our base class. So we'll do message, then args, like so. Let me make sure that works. So we can create a lion, and we can say, is king? We'll say, yes, our lion is king. Now we can uh, check if the lion is king. So we can do is king, and it returns true. And now if we want to check its name, we can say get name, and we see that it is a lion. Um, so you can, you can pretty, I, I can imagine you can see how you can extrapolate this further and even go as far as to um, create just a fully, you know, you, you, can, you can abstract around, you know, this, this, this section right here. You can create a macro to make this all a lot nicer. Um, I believe that's actually how Racket's uh, object-oriented class-based system uh, works under the hood. Um, that's what I suspect. I haven't actually dug into it that much yet. But anyway, um, this is just going to be a kind of a quick video. I just wanted to demonstrate that um, functions and objects are really not all that different. And uh, when it comes to discussing functions versus objects, really it's just a kind of a conceptual way to think about things, right? Do you think about your entire program and all the sub-programs as a, you know, like a set of collection of factories that all pass things to each other? Or do you think of it all as like the solid state uh, state machine, you know? Um, really, it probably goes back to what's the best tool for the, the project, for the job. And um, often I would say it's functional, but you know, I, you do you, all right? Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next.